reason which is, and uh, a reliable analysis can then be applied to many things, such as the example that you gave. So I think that if, uh, if again, the culture, as I say, of science and intellectual inquiry in general were more widespread, questions or concerns such as you raise could be addressed in a more thoughtful manner. I'm Raman Jamal from UKM and thank you Professor Conberg. Uh, I'm very inspired today actually. I'd like to give up my administrative post and go back to the lab. <laughs> uh, which was one of my questions actually. Uh, how do you sort of, uh, sort of uh, rationalize a lot of the talented scientists who are burdened with uh, administrative posts? This happened to the time. Uh, my second question is, uh, you mentioned you attributed your Nobel Prize to sort of your colleagues, hundreds of them working together across uh, many different institutions and so on. Whilst we now are bogged down by issues of IPs and so on. So uh, how do you balance between competitiveness as well as working together to, to sort of, uh, uh, sort of uh, producing results to solve global solutions? And my third question is, uh, <laughs> You mentioned about untargeted uh, research, but a lot of us have been indoctrinated by or even forced to think about beginning with the end in mind, in the sense of trying to ask a question before uh, to, to answer a question or even to solve problem, which in a sense uh, sort of trying to tell us uh, target uh, towards uh, a solution. So how do you comment on that? Thank you. So uh, in regard to the first question, let me answer, or the first couple of questions I'll answer in very general terms. Uh, I alluded a moment ago to the fact scientists are people. Those who work with me, no exception, of course. Uh, and indeed, uh, a good fraction of scientific activity, certainly the role I have played over the years, is one of management. And as I have already mentioned, one of discovering how to uh, encourage and elicit the best that people have to offer. So administration and that is, is uh, very much a part of science, and, but its purpose is ultimately uh, related to human nature, to people, and to what enables them to be most productive to solve the problems uh, that we all set out to do. Now, on the second point that you raise, uh, of um, basic versus applied or even translational science. Um, this is a serious problem. And uh, there is no getting around it. I mean, the fact is that the pressures that we all feel uh, to solve problems directly um, are misguided. And if, uh, as I have pointed out, um, there are very few solutions to pressing problems that are obvious, or else they would already have been done. Um, if they're not obvious, it's because we don't yet know what we need to discover in order to solve the problem. And we're just wasting our time if we beat around the bush and try and do things with today's knowledge that aren't and that is insufficient to address you know, these challenges of the future. So uh, there's no prescription that I can offer. <laughs> uh, no escape that I know of from that, except to try and make the case and do what's best. and. Uh, and wherever possible, uh, to pursue and to an enjoy the pursuit, to relish the pursuit of fundamental truth. Uh, okay, I think I saw you. Good morning, Prof. I'm Sylvia, a postgraduate student. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Prof. Convert's opinion on what is the role of government and local university in cultivating young scientists to explore and deepen their interest in basic science instead of just doing it for academic grading or profit? Thank you. I mean, you know, it's interesting. What you allude to is a problem everywhere. Um, and, um, and I don't have an answer. I see it in my own children. You know, when I was uh, their age, so uh, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, uh, school was less demanding. And I could, I, I could spend most of my time 
some form of recreational activity. And I, I think in retrospect, that's very important ultimately for the possibility of creativity and productivity later in life. I see my kids as I see young people um, all over the world, including in uh, not only in the United States, but in Asian countries, where I have visited in China, Korea, Japan, what have you. Uh, caught in a squeeze between, on the one hand, uh, increasing competition for success in their academic careers, and on the other hand, the proliferation of information that characterizes our age. And uh, it's a terrible bind. Uh, my solution, I'm afraid, uh, which my kids don't listen to, <laughs> is just to ignore it all. Don't do the homework, don't study, don't do this. <laughs> because I think, quite personally, that that's, I, I honestly believe that that is counterproductive. I think that you have to learn principles, and then I think you have to try and apply them, and then you acquire knowledge because you want it, because it interests you, because it relates to the problem of the study. But my solution won't be obviously be very <laughs> widely accepted or even successful. And as I have looked at my own children, it won't be. I saw a hand here. Thank you for the uh, I have a practical uh, question. I'm a visitor to uh, see my name is Shahid. Uh, my question is about the. Uh, how uh, we always have pressure about you know publications and the standard and uh, the impact factors and all that. So quality and quantity, you always have a you know choice to go for quality or quantity. And you know sometimes quality papers that we publish in Science Nature require several years of work with several labs, mm -hmm. and you always have a choice. You know what you do. So uh, look for the, the, the comments. I can perhaps give you an answer by way of example. So the work uh, that I alluded to uh, that we have done um, that was cited by the Nobel Committee took over 20 years and resulted in no publications until the end. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so then you, know, you might reasonably ask, um, how is it possible to support it? Um, how could we possibly engage in that activity all that time? The, American branding agencies take great pride. They say, you know, we supported this work even at a time when it wasn't apparent it would succeed. Uh, that's all nonsense. Um, the truth of the matter is that one had to find ways of sustaining the research, obtaining funds, enabling the careers of young people, while keeping still an eye on the distant goal. And so the challenge that you refer to is one that is ever present will never go away. And you discover how, for example, to publish papers, even when you haven't discovered the answer. <laughs> uh, you figure out how to persuade people to fund the research even when it hasn't succeeded. Um, these, 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 this was my principal activity for those 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Dr. Cole, and I have the last hand. Then we'll stop. Thank you, Dato. Uh, Professor Convert, uh, a lot of people are interested in the world. Uh, there seems to be a preponderance of Jews winning Nobel Prizes in science, medicine, or what have you. Uh, maybe today you can enlighten us on how the Jews seem to be very successful in such a pursuit. Thank you very much, Paul. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's a, that question is impossible for me to answer. I mean, it happens to be true, uh, but my guess is that there will be a preponderance of Asian Nobel laureates in the next generation. Um, they didn't have the same opportunities, they didn't derive from the same culture of science in the previous one. So I would quite confidently predict that will be the case. Um, but to go back and ask why uh, there was a preponderance of Jews in the previous generation, you know, some of them may have been the nature of their education. People often point out the fact, point out the fact that the Jewish religion is one question, but every question is answered with a question. <laughs> um, that uh, it was a it was a habit of mine always uh, to try and probe deeper, and this was something children learned. Um, it was part of their upbringing. 
But again, not only do I not know the answer to that question, but I imagine we may never know. <laughs> Last question. Um, well, if I heard uh, something I would keep lingering my mind and I hope you can inspire me in that. Okay, science is so much so based on what we can see and we believe what we are seeing. But the problem is um, there's so much so limitation in our naked eye. So how could we really um, go beyond this obstacle and really see the signs of field science? Thank you. I didn't fully understand what you feel would be so kind as just to repeat once more. The question is, how can we go beyond what we can perceive with the naked eye? Yes, yeah. because we, we, we only see that we can improve DNA um, by only looking at the gels or anything. We, we only believe in our eyes, but the actual fact is the eye is so, has so much so many patients. An actual fact, what was the last one? Uh, the eye, we have, to, I mean, our and eye. Limitations. Yes, yes. I'm not sure at what level to answer the question, but I might just point out that the image that we produced, for example, of this uh, molecular machine showing the location of this 38,000 atoms was, of course, not possible by um, light photography, by direct imaging of the matter that we're accustomed to doing. It can only be done with these so, uh, highly intense X-ray beams available at uh, accelerators around the world, for example, at the Stanford Linear Accelerator where we did our work. And then the results of scattering X-rays of all the molecules that we studied had to be analyzed using the most powerful computers available at the time. Uh, so nothing that we discovered was in any way visible or even remotely accessible to direct inspection. Uh, such indirect means um, are, of course, the basis of particle physics, quantum chemistry, and ultimately of the underlying principles and the uh, understanding of molecules of human biology. Does that answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I will let you because I don't want you to go home and not be able to sleep tonight. <laughs> uh, good morning, Prof. Robert. Uh, I'm Sue. My name is Sue. I would like to know, um, is it the language is the limiting uh, limiting factor for the success in science in the, national, in the international level, especially for some non-English-speaking country? Thank you. And it's, it's, a, it's a, a very good question that you ask. Um, and, and I think that uh, there is no doubt that I, as a native English speaker, and many others uh, who enjoy that advantage, uh, in fact, have an unfair advantage. Uh, life is not fair. <laughs> uh, there are many such uh, obstacles that we face um, in life. Uh, nevertheless, um, I'm impressed that people here can speak and understand English quite well. Um, I have long been an advocate of uh, a different mode of elementary education. It happens, as you very well know, that children can learn as many languages as they're presented with and speak them as native, if only that is done early in life. Uh, and uh, my own children speak three languages fluently. Uh, and sadly, uh, I can't uh, claim the same thing as a joke that you may have heard. If you were to ask, um, and now I have to use any language, how to describe someone who speaks three languages like my children, you would say they're trilingual. <laughs> if you ask uh, how to describe someone who speaks two languages, the answer is one. If you ask how to describe someone who speaks one language, the answer is American. <laughs> I would suggest that by your capacity to speak and understand English as well as your native language, you're actually well beyond what I can claim and you enjoy a very great advantage in life. Nevertheless, in regard to science, there is no doubt there has to be a universal language and it happens to be English and it enables us all to communicate scientific information. But you and most others are capable of reading and understanding it and so you don't really suffer a severe limitation in that regard.